I'm Janice Edwards. Coming up on Signature Silicon Valley, we're talking about the joy of romance with Joy Nordenstrom, plus a special oral history project with the San Jose Japanese Museum. That and more is next. Join us. This show is sponsored by Edwards Unlimited, a dynamic media production company. You are here for a purpose, and Edwards Unlimited wants to let the world know. We are dedicated to crafting media that engages and inspires. I'm Janice Edwards and welcome to Signature Silicon Valley. We are so glad to have you join us today. And during the month of February, many times the focus is on love. Of course, Valentine's Day happens in the middle of the month. But love is something that guides our lives in so many ways and it's usually the driving force for much of what we do. Joy Nordenstrom is an expert on love. She is the creator of Joy of Romance and you're a success story too because you founded the programs Joy of Romance and the new one that we'll talk about too, the Chemistry Connection, um, after a bad divorce. So let's talk a little bit about how you got into this business. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I actually came up with the idea of Joy of Romance um, because I was in a relationship that was heading downhill. And at that time, I had this epiphany one day that there was so much we were doing to study for exercise, nutrition, even drinking a glass of wine seemed to yes. get more time and energy than learning how to be our best in partnership. So I looked at that time and there wasn't much on the internet besides just religious based approaches to fixing your problems or therapy. We had tried therapy and I'm like, therapy just seems to perpetuate the problem. This isn't making it better. So I wanna, went on a personal quest to try to find how to bring the joy back into relationships and get back to that. My relationship marriage ended quicker than I anticipated, but mm -hmm. what I know now, I know that that particular partnership would not have succeeded for the test of time. So I've really dedicated myself to helping people learn how to choose right from the beginning. So what are some of the keys to choosing right from the beginning? What do you look for? Ah, well, I have studied chemistry, biology, psychology, neuroscience, practical wisdom of what really makes us tick in relationship. I love the why. So mm -hmm. I've gone this whole spectrum and through that study, I've come up with 10 different patterns that we primarily have in relationships. So there's no one size fits all to relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's really about first learning yourself and your own patterns, then figuring out which ones of those really work for you and which ones might be your kind of sticky points mm -hmm. and then being able to quickly assess somebody that you're meeting what their basic patterns are and then do those ones work with you or will they be oil and water so then being able to teach your new partner how best to be in partnership with you is wow what I do. that's a lot of personal scrutiny which is so important yeah. because a lot of times people have connection, chemical connection. Yes. And they feel like, it doesn't matter, I don't care. I want to feel this way forever. And they don't understand that the underlying patterns will eventually erode that great chemical connection. Indeed, it's really when we first fall in love, it's called the attraction phase. And our mm. body is running just as like we are addicted to cocaine. Or they've done ah. studies watching what your brain looks like, and it's like you're chemically addicted to the person. Right. And that that's phase, the dopamine in the brain? Dopamine, mm. norepinephrine, phenylethylamine, um, it's called PEA, okay. and um, all the adrenaline, all of this plays into it. Mm. But it's only meant to last a few months up to four years and then you dip back down into this comfort zone of love. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think, hey, I fell out of love because I'm not getting that high anymore. But our bodies aren't meant to sustain that. It's really about understanding so that you can move into that next phase. That's why I'm so into aphrodisiacs because I love helping people keep the spikes That's alive. Right, <laughs> because that really was a biological um, urge. A, a it was created out of biology because within that four years, people would procreate and then then, and that was the survival instinct, mm -hmm. but now because of how marriage has evolved, relationships have evolved, it does need the aphrodisiacs. You've had, you have cooking seminars, you have a number of things that you offer couples once they find that person to help them understand, yes, you've looked at those patterns, you're with the right person, here's how you sustain it. What are some of the other things that you do? Well, with aphrodisiacs, uh, that's just one of my most fun things. I do really fun events. I have a new series coming out. It started as a, 
uh, in May this year, and it's going to continue once a quarter public events, and then it's going to go into some private events called Devoured. Mm. And they're experiential dinner parties, and they're actually, we're doing one for singles and one for couples. But part of that is teaching people how to have fun, how to respike those love drugs into their system, and to understand their partner. So good communication based on the patterns that each of you have. So one other thing I love to teach couples hopefully as close to the honeymoon phase as possible is something called the rules of engagement. Mm. And it's really based on their love for one another to not do damage to one another when they have conflict or potentially the relationship. And so I can talk on that forever, but I love yes. that. Well, that seems so important too, because certainly with a lot of reality television and you see a lot and it makes for great drama. It makes riveting, sometimes riveting um, viewing or disgusted viewing, depending on <laughs> how you feel about it. But it's all about the conflict. It's mm -hmm. all about kitchen sinking everything and putting down your partner. And then it's, it's you know, you're, you've left devastation yeah. and then people are supposed to kiss and make up. But th what's happened in the argument is sometimes hard to get over. Most definitely. There's a few type of uh, individuals who have a volatile way of communicating. And if they get with somebody else who has that same type, it's okay. It's like the old fashioned show, The Honeymooners. Right. I find it a lot in particular, like, like Greeks and, and Italians, right. they just do that and then they make up passionately. So that's okay, but majority of us have what's called a conflict avoider way of dealing with conflict. And we can get hurt and we sweep a lot under the rug and then all of a sudden one day, bam, you yes. know, it's over. Right. And uh, we didn't even give our partner an opportunity to rise to the occasion and become better in partnership with us because we kept putting it under the rug. Yes, and then also when you deal with challenges of life, because you've shared openly that you've had a number of challenges, and I, I'm sorry too for the loss of your father a few months back, but a brain tumor, fear of um, being diagnosed with cancer, all of this before you had your amazing son, Sterling, with your partner. And I have to say, we've known each other for years. I was actually at Joy's shower, <laughs> And Sterling decided to arrive early. So the shower was cut short because Joy had to go to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and Sterling came forth. But what have you learned through these challenges that you faced with such grace always? Um, but, you know, life-threatening things. How has that shaped how you live now and how you conduct your relationship? Well, it's, uh, it's made the joy of connection, really the truest currency in my life. Mm -hmm. And it's the relationships that I have with not only my partner, my son, my stepkids, my extended you know, family, it's the people that I meet on the street. I want to be able to say that moment in time with that person was truly precious, that I was able to be fully present with them, that I knew how important it was for me not to be telling a story in the back of my head or spinning something else about something else I had to do, but I only get that moment with that person. I want to make it truly an impactful one, and that person knows I'm fully present. So I love helping teach people how to be that present, too. Yes, because that is something that, w like, when your father was passing, I know when my mother was passing that, being present, you're so grateful for it later, but it can be hard and people feel like, I just can't deal with it now, but if they can push through that in those moments, if re that kind of love is something that will sustain them with the memories in the years to come. Yeah, and, and being able, I think one of the best things is those challenges, instead of going, <clears throat> I need to push through it, go, no, I need to slow down and be in it and look at it as an opportunity because the opportunity is there to be able to make a difference in their life and your life forever. That's your memory, that's, that's what you get to have. So for people who say maybe they've been single for a while or they've gone through a breakup, we have just a little bit of time before we go, what's your best advice for someone looking for love during this time? Oh, during a breakup, um, I hope they can come to me and I can help ease that pain, but you need to feel it in order not to have it come up in the next relationship. So really deal with it. Don't just, don't sweep it under the rug and That's then have right. it blow up with the next person in that way. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Right. And then for people who are maybe past that point, they've done some work on themselves, any advice for the next step in finding a great love or connecting with someone? 
understand yourself as much as possible with these patterns and be able to choose wisely so that you set yourself up for success and there's just certain things you want to say and agree on in the very beginning instead of just running on that chemistry and also bring in your friends and family and ask for input because this is an important important decision and you don't want to have blinders of just chemistry on right because a lot of times they'll see those red flags if they're there and if you are open to that it can save heartache most definitely yes well we're about saving heartache and we're about the joy of romance. Joy, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the work that you do that thank makes you. our world a more loving place. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me on, Janet. It's always a pleasure. Oh, I know. It's so good to see you. <laughs> if you'd like to contact Joy, details are on our screen. Tom Izu is the executive director of the History Center at De Anza College. And when you talk about putting your signature on this valley, he's been there for 23 years. Yes. Tom, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having me. Now, one of the things that you've done in addition to the work that you do at De Anza, we want to talk about that in a moment, but you've done some special work with the Japanese History Museum, special projects. Can you share a little bit about that? Yes, of course. Um, I'm on the advisory board of the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. And <coughs> I'm very interested in helping that organization capture some of the history of the different generations of Japanese Americans that have been in this valley, especially through oral history work and finding out stories about their lives. Yes, and I know that you and our good friend Steve Yamaguma have worked together mm -hmm. on an oral history um, video too. Y yeah, what, what um, Steve has helped me do is I'm interested in capturing certain time periods that aren't really covered in the traditional story of Japanese Americans. Like a lot of people learn about the first immigrants coming over and um, there were farmers and then my parents' generation right in the middle of World War II. But my generation, we're called Sansei or third generation, there was a time period in the 1970s where we started to become really uh, concerned about what was happening in our society, kind of like right now uh, mm -hmm. in the present time. And we were concerned about the war in Vietnam, and we were concerned about civil rights, and we were concerned about how we fit into all that, and how we were treated as being Asian, Asian Americans. And uh, the interesting thing in San Jose is there was what we call, what I call the Sansei music scene in the 1970s, mm -hmm. um, where young people were learn, um, influenced by all different kinds of music from different communities, African American, Mexican American, um, and they started to develop their own sound, you know, through pop music. But it was a little bit different because they were also influenced by traditional music from Asia, from Japan. And a lot of people don't know about what happened this time period because people in my generation really haven't had a chance to reflect on it. And we haven't had a chance to think about what we want to share about it. But the things that have come out of it is besides specific music groups that did different versions of uh, folk uh, rock kind of music. There was one famous one called Yokohama, California. That was in San Jose. Yes. Um, there were other people who became, went on to become pretty noted jazz musicians, performers, storytellers. And one of the other stories um, is the San Jose Taiko group. The young people who helped start that were part of that original 1970s music scene where they were really? influenced by oh. pop music, rock music, blues but also traditional Japanese music. And they started creating a new, whole new sound through this experience. So <coughs> what I'm trying to do is find people like this to interview. We've done one group interview some, with some of the different members, like Steve Yamaguma. He was one of the uh, early members of what became the San Jose Taiko group, and yes. PJ and Roy Hirabayashi, Gary Tsujimoto, um, people like that, um <coughs> to find out uh, their stories. And I had originally thought that they had been able to talk a lot about their experiences. Um, but a lot of them have not, because it's just kind of a thing about age. You're too busy trying to do something with your own life until you get a little bit older, you right. know, and then you start talking about it. So I'm, I'm really fascinated with um, trying to document stories like that. So we're just at the very beginning stages. Okay. But that's just kind of one example of a lot of things that are out there that I've discovered doing community history work. It's so important, and we'll put uh, contact information on the screen mm -hmm. at the end so people can reach out to you because Good. people watching will say, I know someone, mm -hmm. or be aware of it. And do you find that for the younger generation of Japanese Americans, is there a lot of interest in the history? I know we can't generalize overall, but mm -hmm. I know sometimes mm -hmm. you find between generations there can be that disconnect because they're so involved with what's happening mm -hmm. now. <coughs> yes, I think that's really true, and um, <coughs> I think that generally is true that um, there, are, there are these disconnections, um, 
And I'd have to say, especially in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. um, I think Silicon Valley is one of the most ahistorical places in the country. Wow. Because the focus is on the present. It's on what's the immediacy, expediency of something, and not really under trying to learn about the past, or surprisingly, even about the place that the history is taking place within. And when I say place, I mean even we're talking about the place where we actually, not virtually, actually live in. And what this causes is a disconnect because you're not able to connect with big issues that are facing your community, your city, your valley, uh, that might be of civic nature, social nature, and you're not that connected to even the physical place, uh, which makes it hard to deal with environmental issues. Mm -hmm. And I think, I really do believe this is all connected to uh, understanding local history, which might seem like it's not, but I think it is, because once you start learning the history of the place, your own how you fit in yourself, your family, your neighbors, yes. you start to have more of a concern. You can have more of a concern about what's really happening. Why, why is my neighborhood this way? Why is my city this way? Right, and it really connects you in that way. That's and certainly right. De Anza College has clearly dedicated itself to the history because you have the center there. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine for students, it, it is really revelatory when they understand what you yeah. offer. Yeah, because we're, we're in a historic building that was uh, preserved a number of years ago. They were planning to dem demolish it when the college bought the property. And it's a very odd looking building from our standards now. It's like this French uh, colonial looking building with these big white columns. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself, the piece that people fought to save it because they thought this would help students actually be interested in like, what's that doing here? And then they learned, well, it used to be here, you know, 1895 it was built. And, and wow. to a lot of the students, they go, really? <laughs> what was here back then? And then you show them photos, you know, it's all mm -hmm. farmland. These people grew grapes. They made wine here right on your campus. Really, they did? The point is to get people to just start thinking and having an, uh, use their imagination. Like, things were really different. Why is that? And now why are they different? What's gonna happen in the future? So I think I'm a really strong believer in the power of local history to help people really understand the present, not just not just dwelling in the past. Yes, and it is truly important because we also don't want to repeat certain mistakes mm -hmm. of history. Yes. And ideally, yes. when you look back and understand what led to that, mm -hmm. hopefully some of those things will not take place in the future. Yeah, and that, that brings up another uh, issue that I'm very concerned with. Um, my center received funds from the family of a former board member who passed away a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the fund was um, to not only help the History Center endure, because we've gone through some pretty rough financial times and a lot of community colleges have, but it's also to learn lessons from past civil liberties violations. In this case, mm -hmm. it had to do with the Japanese American internment. And so that's another thing that I'm very concerned about is promoting the education uh, of students and community to understand what civil liberties are all about and use something like the Japanese American tournament as a starting point to understand, and I think it's really relevant now, what rights we have and how we need to continue to, to defend them and continue to educate people about them. Yes, it is critical that people be educated about civil liberties. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you for you. the work that you're doing to help us appreciate the past and hopefully mm -hmm. make wiser choices in the future. Thank you very much. If you'd like to contact Tom, details are on our screen. And that's our show. I'm Janice Edwards. Thank you for joining us and for putting your signature on our valley in a major way. Please join us again next time. We look forward to seeing you then. This show is sponsored by Edwards Unlimited, a dynamic media production company. You are here for a purpose, and Edwards Unlimited wants to let the world know. We are dedicated to crafting media that engages and inspires.